Good morning, everyone. Welcome. This is our Health as a Human Right themed Learning for Life lecture series, as you know. My name is Tracy Bowen. Um, I'm the Executive Director of Alumni Relations here at the University of Manitoba and a very proud UM alum. So before we begin and before I introduce our speaker today, I'd like to acknowledge that the University of Manitoba campuses are located on the original lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, OG Cree, Dakota, and Denny peoples, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. We respect the treaties that were made on these territories. We acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past, and we dedicate ourselves to move forward in partnership with Indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. So uh, just a few housekeeping details. There will be time for questions. So those of you who are joining us virtually, uh, we will just be posting them up on the screen. So please do have your questions ready. And then myself and Dustin will also be walking around for those of you here in person with the mic uh, to ask your questions. Um, so, and then also, um, really, I, I also wanted to do just a shout out to our affinity partner sponsor, uh, IA Financial Group. With their support, we're able to offset some of the costs uh, with hosting this program. So now, let's get to why we're all here, which is I'm going to introduce Dr. Lori Kirschenbaum, who I know I say this all the time, but he's literally one of my favorite people. He, he, this is also his third time presenting. So again, he presented with the Seniors Alumni Program, the Virtual Learning for Life, and now the Learning for Life. So he's, uh, he's He's a crowd favorite. So let me share a little bit about Dr. Kirschenbaum with you. So he's not a one, not a two, but a three-time University of Manitoba graduate, which is wonderful, uh, receiving his PhD in cardiac physiology from the Max Rady College of Medicine in 92. And in 1995, Dr. Kirschenbaum was recruited to the Institute of Cardiovascular Sciences at the St. Boniface Hospital Albrechtson Research Center. And so for the past 21 years, Dr. Kirschenbaum has received continuous research funding from the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, Heart and Stroke Foundation, and other agencies. Dr. Kirschenbaum is also the Director of Research Development for the Rady Faculty of Health Sciences and holds a prestigious Canada Research Chair Molecular in Cardiology. Uh, Dr. Kirschenbaum is also a professor in the Departments of Physiology and Pharmacology and Therapeutics at the University of Manitoba, and he's internationally recognized for his studies on the molecular mechanisms that govern cell growth and cell death in the heart under normal and disease conditions. He's also, as you can imagine, received many accolades and awards, including the University of Manitoba Distinguished Alumni Award and Professional Achievement in 2018, and the Canadian Cardiovascular Society Research Achievement Award in 2020. Needless to say, he's the real deal and knows what he's talking about. So with that, over to you, Dr. Kirschenbaum. Thank you very much, Tracy. I'm, I'm delighted. And after all that, I don't think there's much time for the rest of the, rest of the talk. Actually, I'm not sure if my mom has tuned in, uh, but I hope that she will. That introduction was really terrific. I'm sure she would have really appreciated it. So um, anyway, without further ado, first of all, let me uh, express my gratitude to the audience in person uh, for being here. Uh, I know it's challenging with uh, the way we've arranged seminars in the past with, uh, with Zoom, and some folks um, are able to join us internationally and uh, locally because of unable uh, or interest in, in meeting in public. And I'm, I'm delighted to be here, whether I was telling Tracy whether it's two people or 20 people or 200, I, I'd prefer to, to lecture in person. And so uh, thank you very much for, for being here. And Tracy, thank you for that wonderful introduction. So um, w without further ado, I, I wanted to share with you um, a little bit about the work that we've been engaged in over the, over the past uh, several years. The title of the talk was uh, No Time to Waste, and it generated quite a bit of interest because people wondered what he was talking about. No time to waste. No time to waste for what? So um, the real play on it was the influence of disrupted circadian rhythms in the development of cardiovascular disease. And what I want to share with you, and this is the nutshell of the talk, is really the impact of our daily lifestyle, the impact of circadian biology, which is a rhythm that our biological clock, if you will, follows uh, throughout a 24-hour light cycle. And for the next uh, 40 or so minutes, I'd like to share with you the impact of how uh, disrupted circadians affect cardiovascular disease. So what is a circadian? Well, um, the body has a clock. We all heard about my clock isn't working properly. I've, I've traveled somewhere and I'm jet lagged, uh, et, et cetera, and we'll talk about that. But more importantly, all our biological processes that we have, whether we eating, sleeping, drinking, um, our moods are all dictated in a 24-hour cycle by the circadian. Uh, 
And the circadian we'll talk about is, is really dictated by um, the light-dark cycle. And so in this cartoon, we can see that we have a clock. The clock is, is a biological clock, and it'll dictate when we eat, when we, when we think, when we sleep, when we drink. And it's impacted by a number of different activities. So the word circadian actually came from circa, which was the global meaning, you know, uh, round, and diem, which many of us know from carp diem or uh, a day. And so this was put together circadian in terms of um, a, a relationship between something that was happening during the day and that was circumvented or, or circumscribed by the entire day of, of, of our activities. So. Our biological clock is basically based on a 24-hour cycle, and that's largely due to the fact that where we're living on the Earth and its proximity to the sun and the fact that we rotate around um, the axis, Earth's axis, in a 24-hour cycle. So 12 hours light, 12 hours dark. And every biological organism, with the exception of a few, follow this pattern. So if we were to, um, let me just advance the slide. Um, one of the things that I'm gonna share with you very briefly, which I thought was quite funny, um, was the fact that you know, these biological rhythms are critical for our daily activities and they follow the light-dark cycle, but they're in, in ensuring that we're eating and sleeping and drinking and our metabolic pathways are, are all synchronized. And I thought this was kind of interesting because uh, we all know what Einstein did, but his, his remark really was the only reason uh, for time is that everything doesn't happen at the same time, right? So, so everything doesn't happen at once. And so this was really quite interesting and that's truly what biological rhythms are. So if you take a look where we are on our planet, we have Earth, we have the Sun, we have the Moon. And there are different phases of the Moon and different phases of the Earth. And we rotate on our axis in a 24-hour cycle, 12 hours light, 12 hours dark. And all the organisms on the, on the planet evolved um, on this 12-hour light, 12-hour dark cycle. So if you're living on Mars or Venus, the daylights would be much longer and they, or the evenings would be much shorter. And all the biological processes evolved to uh, adapt to these uh, uh, light dark uh, cues. So I'll take you a little bit about history, talk a little bit about history, and uh, everyone can be a scientist. This is what I love about what I do. So this image was taken from a, an individual, a French scientist, Jean-Jacques de Martin, de Marien. And so, and so what did he do? He basically observed and if you remember Mendel and the peas in the, in, in, in the old 1800s, it all started with plants. Observational science, I think it's terrific. So the individual had a plant, and he basically found that the leaves opened during the daylight. And here it is. Oops, let me go back, go back, go back, go back. That's not good. Okay, so um, the, basically the, 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 the leaf of the plants, oh, the pointer is on the side here. The mouse? Oh yes, of course. You know, you'd think this is the first time I gave some kind of talk. You know, this is what it is. So, you know, the speaker always gets up and they're always, you know, given these talks before, but they have no clue how to operate the audiovisual. Okay, so I'm guilty of that. The, the cool thing about the observational science is that the individual found that this plant's leaves opened up during the day, but at night they closed. And even more so, when, he's, when he hid the plant from, from, from daylight, the leaves didn't open either. So this was really the one, if, one of the very first observations that a biological process, the leaves opening and closing, were somehow tied to, to light and, and, and dark cycle. This was 300 years ago. This was 1729. It took 300 years for the Nobel Prize to be awarded to Jeffrey Hall, Michael uh, Robash, and uh, Michael Young for their contributions to the discovery of the circadian rhythm and the molecular mechanisms that understand how light is transmitted from the brain to the different parts of the body that regulate uh, these processes. So this is basically how it works in a nutshell. So I've talked, ab I've talked about light, I'll go back. Again, this is, this is good. We've all been there. I'm going to just use the laptop. So, so uh, biological processes are activated by light. Light is transmitted. It's received by the retina. 
Um, there's a process in the brain called the suprachiasmic nucleus. It processes these biological signals, these chemical signals, and transmits it to different parts of the body. So that's basically, it. light comes into the eyes, it's processed at the, at the level of the brain, and then all these neurohormonal signals, chemicals if you will, um, activate downstream processes. So if we look at Peruvian man, we can see that these biological processes do function during the different times of the day. And what's really interesting, we don't think about it because it's automatic. We're doing things during the day that we don't even know about. We become hungry, we become tired, we become moody. Not all of us become moody, but some people become moody. And, and this is all based on time of the day. Try going the afternoon without eating and how people get grumpy, they get hangry, right? This is all time to circadian and biology because the body wants to be fed. Okay, so let's go through this. If we take a look at noon, we start at noon, and you can see the light is shining and the trees are happy. And as we go through the cycle, we can see that most of our coordination, most of our activity is really great in the afternoon. And this is really important because it'll come up later in the talk. If you ever go for a run or you're athletic or you ever watch a sports event, you will notice that the 100 meters and all the major events are held later in the afternoon. It is beyond just you know sponsorship and TV rights and everything like that. It's because the athlete's performance is better in the afternoon than it is in the morning. And that can be multifactorial. It could be the way our body is tuned to the light, it's tuned to the energy balance that we've, we've had. But later afternoon, we're very astute and we are ready to go. Toward the later part of the day, as it starts getting a little darker, our blood pressure changes. We can see that our blood pressure and temperature change. There's changes in, in, in chemicals like melatonin. Um, biological processes tend to be suppressed. And then, you know, this period of time, we should be sleeping. Not everyone does, but we do begin to sleep. Deepest sleep is around 2 a.m. And then to around 4 o'clock or so, if you're not up in the middle of the morning for one reason or the other, um, our body temperature changes. Sometimes you wake up in the middle of the night and you're freezing, right? We've all experienced that. Blood pressure changes. It goes up in the morning. And here we are. Highest alertness around 10 o'clock. So thank goodness I'm giving the talk now and not later in the day. <laughs> Um, and then we cycle again to noon. So the point of showing this is to demonstrate that our biological clock, our biological processes are tied to the light-dark light cycle. And what makes this even more profound is that every organ in the body has its own biological clock. So while I said earlier that the light comes into the retina and it's processed at the suprachiasmic nucleus, that's basically the central pacemaker, the central clock. But each organ, the kidneys, the heart, the liver, spleen, it doesn't matter. All these different organ systems have their own clocks and they're all doing their own, their own thing. And they're all timed and they're all sequential and they all relate to the, to the master clock. But it's interesting that these different uh, programs are, uh, are inherent to our DNA. Anybody in the audience that likes to stay up late? Oh, yes. And those who want to go to bed early, yeah. All right, so did you ever think about this? It's very interesting that um, as we age, as, as teenagers, as a teenager myself, I didn't want to go to bed. My mother will attest, I was probably, I never slept. I was probably thinking about experiments that I would like to do when I was older. But as a, as a kid, I never would sleep. And as a teenager, you want to stay up all night. And we have two teenagers, and they're telling me that the day starts at one o'clock. The day's half over at one o'clock, come on. So, as we age, we want, as we age, our, our, our interest in, in, um, in sleeping increases. We just get more tired, and that's part of the biological process and part of the aging process. So, you know, I find myself 10:30 at night, 11 o'clock at night. Okay, um, after the news, I'm done. I want to, I want to go to bed, but I'm up early, 5:30, 6 o'clock. There are some people I know that don't go to bed till after two. And so those individuals are the night owls. And we can see here that if you take a look at where they are, they, they may start, um, let's, this, is, this, is the, this is the lark, and this is the owl. So the owl goes to bed quite late, um, basically here, and they wake up, and then they start their day, and they have a full day, but they go to bed much later. And the lark, on the other hand, is much, uh, it goes to bed earlier and, and wakes up. That's inherent, that's biologically programmed, 
in, in, our, in our DNA, when, what the type of personalities we have and, and how we are uh, responding to light and dark, but it's also changes with age. These are things that we can't change. So as you get older, the ability to, to want to sleep is, is increased, but a lot of people stay up later. Uh, and, they, and they wake up middle of the night and, and, and sleep and circadian are, are very tightly uh, close together. So you may want to watch the late night TV show and then in the morning you wake up and, and you're dead, but uh, you can't function. But it, this is just inherent to who we are. So even amongst yourselves in this audience, you immediately identified some folks would like to stay up and some want to sleep. So one of the things that's really interesting in terms of cardiovascular disease and how that links to um, circadian biology is that one of the classical, one of the early classical um, identifications to prove that the circadian biology was important uh, in regulating uh, physiology, particularly cardiac function, was looking at heart rate and blood pressure. So if we look at, at blood pressure, or pardon me, let's look at heart rate first. So if we look at uh, heart rate over a 24-hour period, Going, going throughout the day, we can see that it, that it peaks around 8, 9 o'clock, and then it'll kind of drop off, and it'll drop, and then as we, uh, as we go to sleep, it, it comes down. And then, it, and then the cycle will start again. And the same thing with blood pressure. Blood pressure is really interesting because, um, go back, blood pressure will go down, it will come up, it will, uh, it will basically uh, plateau and then drop again. So this is when we sleep. So you can see that it, that it waxes and wanes throughout the day. This isn't random. This is absolutely cyclic, and it's dependent upon the internal body clock. And notice when we're sleeping, you know, there's no access to light, but that's already pre-programmed. So heart rate, blood pressure change throughout the 24-hour cycle. One of the things I wanted to share with you was why this talk became so interesting and, and the research, um, as Tracy mentioned, my research really is focused on understanding why when people have heart attacks, the cells of the heart muscle die. And ultimately, when the heart muscle cells die, it impairs the heart's ability to pump blood. And that ultimately leads to heart failure. And so one of the discussions we had in the lab, is this a time-dependent event? Are people more likely to have heart attacks in the morning, in the evening? I'll talk about that. And, and what is the biology behind it? What are, what are the, the cellular pathways behind it? But before I do that, I just want to show you what we take for granted sometimes, how prevalent heart disease is in our, in our community. Heart disease and stroke is really quite prevalent. And why this talk becomes relevant uh, is, is this very fact. So if you think about this, this is a statistic that was pre prepared by uh, the Canadian uh, Cardiovascular Society. Basically, every seven minutes in Canada, someone will die or have some kind of an affliction from stroke or, or cardiovascular disease. And this typically occurs more frequently in women, which I'm glad to see a lot of women in the audience, um, more even so than, than cancer. And that's something that we're getting a greater appreciation about, that women have different presentations of heart disease, they have developed different forms of heart disease than men, and, and, and unfortunately, they're treated the same way men are treated. So um, one of the programs that I've initiated at, at the St. Bonaventure Hospital is something that we're moving forward with, is developing a woman heart health center that will be dedicated to looking at heart disease in women and in terms of prevention, education, something that's, that's on the horizon. But the point is, is that the heart disease in women is very, very prevalent. Basically, if you look at most, most uh, mortalities, you can see that 29% of all deaths occur from some form of heart disease. So it's, it's really an important area of study. It's an important area that we should be thinking about. And more importantly, this affects our indigenous population uh, quite significantly. So um, this is due to largely uh, remote medicine, in a, inaccessibility to healthcare, um, also genetic and, and biological variances that, that do promote uh, greater heart disease um, in, in, in this community. But I also wanted to share with you that there are several risk factors. Um, lack of physical activity, alcohol, um, you know, high, high blood pressure. So it's important to keep an eye on our biological functions that, that are important for regulating um, normal uh, heart health. Um, diabetes, which is very, very prevalent now in our community, particularly in our young, in the youth, young children developing type 2 diabetes, largely because they're sedentary and they don't, they don't move around. And COVID didn't help because uh, people are sitting around, they would otherwise be walking or meeting with people, kids would be on a soccer pitch playing soccer, but now they're, you know, with, uh, you know, Nintendo or the, the latest uh, um, 
uh, PlayStation uh, uh, video game. So that's created a problem. And more importantly, our healthcare system is bursting if it already hasn't. And, you know, it's a huge burden. Individuals who develop heart failure, which is, I mentioned earlier, I study, these are, these are folks who are really suffering. Um, they, they require costly long-term care. It impacts not only their contribution to society, but also the caregivers, their families, if they have people to help look after them. Um, it affects them as well. So when you think about heart disease in a general sense, it's a really large burden to, to our population, not only in, in Canada, North America, but worldwide. So, so that was my pitch, and I just want to show this last cardiovascular uh, graph is to demonstrate, because I think we're probably all in this, in this demographic. Um, what's interesting is, uh, let me grab the, the mouse. Let's see if the mouse is working. So this was the original slide, right? The original uh, line it was only studied, heart disease was only studied in, in, um, in men. Uh, this is both sexes, and this is women. And what's interesting, you can see the rise over age. You can see the rise in heart disease in women. And if this went further, it'll eclipse uh, heart disease in men. And again, different forms of heart disease. So this is the pitch that heart disease is really important to think about and to study and to research and, and uh, talk about. And that's why we got interested in the circadian biology. And this is why. This is the slide I was talking about. So if you take a look at heart attack, acute myocardial infarction, that's a heart attack. It's likely to occur more frequently in the morning. Same thing with uh, cerebral infarction, a stroke, uh, is essentially a heart attack that occurs in the brain. Lack of blood flow will cause the, uh, neuronal cells to die or a, a burst vessel, a hemorrhagic stroke. But the point is these afflictions will occur more likely in the morning. And different forms of these diseases will occur in different times of the day. So atrial fibrillation or ventricular tachycardia, which is a really rapid heart, heartbeat, um, or in some cases, fibrillation can be lethal, again, in the morning hours. Why is that? So again, I'll talk a little bit about that as we move forward. But our interest in understanding uh, heart disease and its relation to the biological clock is, is based on what I was, I was mentioning. I mentioned earlier about the athletes and you know performance, peak performance being greater in the afternoon. It's the same thing with cardiac surgery, and particularly valve replacement. This, there was a really nice uh, paper that came out by this uh, French group in The Lancet by uh, Montagna et al. And they basically demonstrated that if someone was to have an aortic valve replacement, now this is because the valve within the heart itself became defective and it needed to be replaced, the, the, the um, perioperative outcomes were better if the surgery was done in the afternoon. And that's stratifying for patient morbidity, pre-existing disease, stratifying for the skill set of the surgeon, uh, the surgical team. It just, the outcome seemed to be better in the afternoon than the morning. And this is for this particular type of surgery. It could be, um, it could be the amount of uh, cross-clamp time in the OR in terms of how the valve is replaced and the amount of blood flow going to the heart. It could be a variety of different mechanisms, but it's all circadian dependent. You could argue perhaps the surgeon was, was at, at their peak in the afternoon and the, and the, and the biological processes that uh, involve repair are better in the afternoon, so the patient had a better outcome. You know, so, so, so the point of sharing this with you is to demonstrate that this isn't trivial, that our, our biological clock has a, has a major effect on, uh, on, our, on, our, on disease outcome. So this take home message was just for basically a ver aortic valve uh, transplant, but at the end of the day, you can't dictate when you're gonna have, have the surgery. The surgeon says you gotta come, you gotta, you gotta go. Um, but anyway, this is just uh, something to think about. What about drug efficiencies? You know, um, when we take a drug in the morning or take a drug in the afternoon, does it, does it uh, have any difference? And what about side effects and tolerance? And so there's a lot of evidence to suggest that, you know, some of the side effects and tolerance of, of many medications dis display a, a biological va variation. Some uh, drugs are administered not only with food to prevent upset stomach, but the doctor will tell you to take it in the morning or take it in the evening, and why? And, and that is how uh, the drug was designed or the physician felt that the drug would have a better effect on a given biological process to lower blood pressure or to uh, change uh, lipid metabolism if you were taking a, a lipid-lowering drug. Even the biological side effects of, of the drug may have a greater effect if you took it in the morning 
than if you took it later in the day. Hey, I took it my pill in the morning and I didn't have an effect, but when I took it at, you know, in the evening after dinner, I had more of an effect. Um, so timing, timing of, of the medication seems, seems to be important. And uh, circadian uh, rhythms can be modulated by different therapeutics. So on this, in this complex diagram I show here, here's basically the, the, the clock, the master clock in the brain, and the peripheral clocks I was talking about that have their own, have their own clocks. There's lung and kidney and liver and bone, et cetera. And different drugs get de detoxified by the liver differently, and in the result, they produce different byproducts, different different um, different substances that then can go on and affect uh, different cells or different uh, uh, different organ systems. And it wasn't so much to show you that um, these pathways get affected, but there's two things to take home from this diagram: one, that uh, drugs. Um, have different effects at different times of the day, and two, that you can modify the circadian biology with different forms of drug. So, you know, that's something that we, wanna, we may want to talk about a little later. I have some slides we can chat about. I didn't want to get into a lot of detail, but the question is if circadian biology is so important, um, are there ways to, to think about this? And the answer is yes. I want to just show this um, uh, this uh, uh, table of, of a variety of very, very common uh, drugs that are given for treating cardiovascular disease. Some of them may be known to many of you in the audience. Those of you, uh, I'm not sure if you can see the slide um, uh, virtually, but I'll just read out some of these um, compounds. For example, um, drugs that are used to treat angina, nitroglycerin, beta blockers, a variety of them um, are, are, are known. As acetyl salicylic acid, which is aspirin, which is used as an antiplatelet, has a better effect in the morning um, uh, than, it, than it would in the afternoon. So the people are suggesting to take this at different times of the day um, because of the fact that it affects blood coagulation. Um, if you take a look at the statins, this is a very, very common lipid-lowering drug. Um, it has a different effect if it's taken in the morning or evening because the body synthesizes cholesterol and lipids at different times of the day. So you want to take it while the cholesterol is being synthesized because this particular class of drugs block cholesterol synthesis. So you know if the cholesterol is already synthesized, it's there. You're not going to do anything once it's formed. You, you want to get to the pathway. You want to, you want to target that uh, that pathway, in this case, lipid metabolism, lipid synthesis, uh, at, at, or cholesterol synthesis at the time of, of production. And, and lastly, the beta blockers. Beta blockers are very, very commonly used to treat blood pressure, to treat arrhythmias, um, a variety of other things. And um, again, they have different effects uh, at different when given at different times of the day. So if you're taking a, a beta blocker at night uh, to lower your blood pressure, I mean, blood pressure typically drops at night. Um, you know, there may be discussion why you'd want to take the blood pressure lowering drug at night versus in the day, unless it's to, you know, support when you wake up in the morning, your blood pressure is, is normalized. But, but the point of telling you this wasn't necessarily for you to run to your, your doctor and say, I'm taking my, my lipid lowering drug in the morning or my beta blocker in the evening. It's to make you aware that what we eat and what we take in terms of pharmaceuticals or anything else have a, have a dramatic effect not only on the body, but in a time-dependent manner. So this time-dependent effect on cardiac disease and cardiac outcome, I'm going to share with you some of our recent data. And this is something that we became really interested in. And it was one of these kind of observational um, areas, just like the, the French scientist and the plant. Why are the leaves opening and closing in response to sunlight? So Lori is sitting with his lab staff, and we've got a group, and we're talking about this. Why is disease onset for cardiovascular disease greater in the morning than the afternoon? And without getting into detail, I could say, oh, so what are the genetic mechanisms? What are the genes that are being activated at the molecular cellular level that are doing this? And that's what we're studying. But the big picture is, why is, why is this important? Cancer, th cancer therapies. One of the drugs that we study in the lab is a drug called doxorubicin. This is a, a very effective chemotherapeutic drug that's used to treat ovarian cancer, breast cancer, and some forms of lymphoma. It works very, very well. But it has a very, very nasty side effect, which is it, it causes cardiac damage. It'll ultimately cause cardiac failure. And this is something that we, that we study in the lab. Um, the reason it causes cardiac failure is it because it damages the cells of the heart. It's just inherent to the drug and inherent to the way the heart muscle cells 
are, are, are designed. They are very sensitive to this drug. But it makes a difference if you give the drug in the morning or you give the drug in the afternoon, whether the cardiotoxicity associated with this, with this compound will be greater or less. Unfortunately, you know, when, when someone shows up at cancer care, they can't dictate when they're going to get the medication. They get it when they get it, if they can get it in a timely manner. But again, the, the disease processes, such as, you know, bladder cancer, lymphoma, as I've got on the slide, they all follow a biological pattern. And then the administration of the drug could have a, you know, a, a tremendous in, impact. So um, this was done in, in mice, in rodents, and we found that doxorubicin in the morning uh, treatment had a greater effect in terms of less cardiotoxicity, less cardiac effect than if the drug was given in the afternoon. And so um, where we're moving in terms of medicine now is precision medicine, tailoring medicine and therapies toward a person and, and their uh, genetic profile or even thinking about um, these sort of um, processes. This was never thought about uh, years ago and I think what was really interesting is, is understanding how these biological processes are linked to disrupted circadian. So the normal circadian is shown here in blue, and the question is, what happens if we disrupt it? We shift it. And so what would cause a disruption in the circadian? You know, short of, short of moving to the moon or short of jet lag, I was just in Croatia, so uh, I came back on Wednesday, so uh, I'm still with a seven hour, eight hour time shift. But, but the thing is, we adapt. You know, and, and the word that also became interesting, are we more susceptible to disease if we travel? Are we more likely to get a cold? Are we more likely to get sick if we travel? Greater incidence of heart attack, et cetera. And the answer is yes. So disrupting the circadian has a major effect on our responses. This is a really interesting slide because this looks at age and this looks at disease. So let's look at, at this. Babies and children. Look, this is, this is a really interesting, interesting observation. This is disease severity on the y-axis. That's the best of my science, so I won't bore you with the science details. And the, and, and the x-axis is really the variable, the babies and children, teenagers, and middle age and older folks. Okay, so at one point I was here, but now I think I'm over here. That was supposed to be funny. I mean, you guys are all retired mostly. You know, this is life for learning. You're supposed to laugh. I'm in the same category as you, and you're... Okay, thank you. This is a tough crowd, Tracy. I, I... If, we, if, we look, if we look at some of, the, some of the symptoms, irritability, mood swing, fatigue, etc., this actually increases and changes with, with, with time. And this is very common to, uh, to, to young people. You see a, a colicky babies, etc. And as we move with time, teenagers and, and young adults, we can see changes in a variety of symptoms, you know, GERD and obesity and, uh, you know, anxiety. And we move forward to middle age, now we see insufficient sleep, we see rheumatoid arthritis, all the things that you know, all of us are kind of feeling now as we get older, um, you can see that there's a disease progression. So where you wouldn't see Alzheimer's and Huntington's disease, which are neurological diseases in younger folks, typically, although it can happen, you see it more in older age. And again, that's all tied to timing. It's, it's timing of repair processes. It's timing of, of uh, you know, the relationship between age and our reparative processes. So this is a really interesting slide because it shows you very nicely the link between circadian and disease development over time. Something to, I guess, look forward to. So who has disrupted circadian rhythms? So shift workers, people we have, people who, who suffer jet lag, like myself, who might be you know, still in, in uh, European time. Um, social jet lag, this is new. This is new. With the advent of uh, social media, social jet lag has evolved. What is social jet lag? Social jet lag is normally you'd be out on the weekend spending, you know, maybe in a couple extra hours. You'd go to bed at 10 o'clock. Now you're going to bed at 2 o'clock in the morning. You're not used to it. You sleep in in the morning and you have social jet lag or you can't function the next day. Social jet lag, new terminology. When I was growing up, I didn't have social jet lag. I was just, I was just tired. And of course, daylight savings time. The one hour shift, believe it or not, has a dramatic impact on our outcome. Again, different in men and women, but it'll take close to, believe it or not, that one hour shift will take, will take 30 days. That will take a month for us to realign. And it's changed with the light-dark cycle. Greater incidence of 
of uh, disease, greater accidents, car accidents, um, a variety of different uh, events occur. Why? Because that one hour not only changes the way the, the sun is in the horizon, we're driving the car, um, it changes our light cues. And what one hour we think is very, very nominal, it has a, has a dramatic effect. And I believe there was some discussion about doing away with daylight savings time. Um, I think it's this year or next year uh, for, this, for this very reason. Because if you look at the presentation in the emergency rooms, daylight savings time has, it's huge. It, it, it really is. So it's, you know, early on, you know, it was to give us an extra hour to harvest the fields, right? And uh, farmers for to, uh, farmers to uh, uh, collect the crop. Um, but obviously this, uh, this is an issue. I mean, many of you, I'm sure, would um, come home from work and it's dark. You go to sleep and you wake up in the morning and go to work, it's dark. You know, and so all I see is in my window, I, you see a, you know, a gray sky, gloomy kind of thing in, in, in the winter time, but it's dark all the time. And that is a huge, huge impact of, uh, uh, on our being. I mentioned this about the disrupted circadian rhythms. Why? Because it affects our ability to think, uh, greater in increased incidence of accidents because we're either daydreaming, we're not focused, uh, the mood changes. This is, I mentioned earlier, about being kind of hangry. Um, believe it or not, this is all, you know, those cues saying, yeah, I'm hungry, I got to eat. It's beyond that. It's basically the cells of the body saying, I need food. And so the signals go back to the brain. The brain says, you need to eat. Um, is a great story. I mean, if you have a, a, a baby, the baby is crying, often mom will want to feed the baby because, you know, the baby's crying. But I remember I was traveling one time, I was in Europe, and I called home and I called my parents and I said, yeah, yeah, I got here and I was on the other side of the, the planet, the other side of the world. It was a long trip to Australia and I was kind of miserable because obviously I hadn't slept on the plane, I got there, and I was cranky. I was really cranky. My mom could tell I was cranky. I hope she's watching. She was, I was cranky. And the, she said to me, the first thing, she says, when was the last time you ate? And uh, I said, yeah. She says, go find something to eat. Call me in a half an hour. I had something to eat. I felt better, you know, and, uh, and that sort of thing. So, so it does make a difference. And all these anecdotal experiences that I'm trying to share with you, um, I've translated into kind of understanding, uh, you know, the inquisitive kid, why these things happen. And so translated into uh, trying to understand human disease. But this really shows you how diverse this is. Weakened immunity, you know, risk for heart disease, risk for diabetes. Um, we'll go back here for just a second. Um, you know, poor balance blood pressure changes. And even our own um, data showed that, you know, what I've shown up until now is demonstrating that if you change the light-dark cycle as one cue, one trigger to f mess up the circadian, we can actually recapitulate that by messing up the different genes that regulate the circadian. So what I didn't want to get into was the fact that at the DNA level, within our DNA, there are a number of genes that regulate the clock. And some of these genes, some of them are called clock. There's one gene called the clock gene, one gene called cryptochrome and period, and it, it's, et cetera. And they work together. They're activated at different times of the day. And what we were curious about was what would happen if you mutated one of these genes, the clock gene. And what was, what was really fascinating is if you simply look at the wild-type mouse, these are, these are lab mice, you can see essentially the same litter mate fed exactly the same thing. You can see this one is 30 grams, this one is 40, almost 44. This is doing nothing to the animal. So simply removing the clock gene, allowing it to eat uh, as, uh, you know, ab libitin, as, at, at whatever it wanted, um, it develops a metabolic syndrome. So it has high blood pressure, it has high hyperlipidemia, um, and it becomes obese. This is a fat mouse. Um, so, and you know, the neurological folks, the neurological uh, defects have been studied in these animals uh, by the psychologists and individuals who are interested in understanding the relationship between brain and, 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 uh, and body. And these animals will develop by their metrics, depression and some forms of bipolar disorder. But, but, but showing you this, that if you disrupt the circadian either directly, genetically, or by fooling around with the light-dark cycle, you have a dramatic effect on some physiology. What about the ICU settings? Well, this is, this is horrible. This is really terrible. Not only for someone to land up in the ICU, intensive care, um, it's, it's uh, a horrible place to be. And, you know, it was, it, there's a quote I have from, from a, a colleague of mine, an older 
cardiologist at Harvard, uh, I'm gonna share with you in the next slide. But what, what I just wanted to share with you, what happens when someone does show up at the ICU? They're in a room, they're not alone, they have noise, continuous lighting, they're either sedated for some reason or another, they're stressed because they're there because they're not well, um, they're fatigued, they haven't slept, um, there may be a surgery pending or they just came out of surgery, there's pain involved, um, they may or may not be on a mechanical ventilator to keep them uh, breathing. And, um, this, you know, and, and the constant noise, the ringing of the phone, um, the, the, the beeping of the alarms to change the IV bag or timing of the medication, it has a huge impact so, um, you know, on, on the outcome of the individual. And it's only becoming more recently that uh, people are, are, are thinking about these and the ICUs are being redirected to, to address these issues. This was taken from, from uh, Eugene Brunwald. Now, uh, Brunwald was basically the, the, I call him the grandfather of uh, modern day cardiology. Um, really, one of the pioneer leaders in this, in this area. Um, I fortunately met him several years ago. He's uh, still practicing as a retired physician at uh, Harvard Medical School. And he wrote in a review article, as an intern in 1952, we admitted patients, AMI is acute myocardial infarction, wherever a bed was available on the medical service, but as far away from the nurse's stations as possible so that would not disturb, disturb, um, be disturbed by the uh, commotion, especially the frequent telephone ringing. Isn't it interesting, in 1952, this was recognized. Has anybody seen, I would like to show this picture of the phone to a millennial, right? <laughs> We, we did this in the lab. I had some new students start, right? And, and we showed them a computer disk, right? Oh, no, 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 I know what I did. We showed them a computer disk, but more importantly, we showed them a cassette tape. We gave them a cassette and a pencil. And I said, what do you do with this? And they looked, they said, first of all, what is, what is the cassette? But you know, you used to, used to wind, put the, put the pencil or pen in the cassette to wind the, 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 the um, uh, tape around the, uh, the spool. So I'd like to show this picture of a phone to a millennial and see what they, they, uh, they think. But, but, but anyway, the point is, is that this is very important and it was recognized early on and so modern day ICUs are thinking about this and so um, they're taking into account that there's now um, sequenced uh, light on, light off. Um, you know, people are looking at the ways that um, the ICU can, can be better suited toward uh, patient outcome and care because as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, um, the effects of drugs, the effects of the immune system, the effects of body healing are all circadian dependent and so the exposure to light, dark, um, and even the availability of sleep uh, make a difference. So this was a, uh, a modern, a mo and, and the other thing that I, I want to comment on is that in, in some cases, this was taken from a, a, a European uh, uh, journal that I had, had, uh, had recently read, and, and the ICUs are being set up differently. So in this image, this, there's an individual in this bed, and then there's some space, and there's an individual in, in this bed. But in, in some of the modern ICUs that we've seen, um, even in Winnipeg that we're developing, they're actually separate units. Right, like the cardiac ICU at, uh, at St. Bonavis Hospital, th you don't have patients sharing beds. They are in individual uh, rooms. I was gonna say cubicles, but that would imply kind of small. They're in good sized rooms, but they're separated. And so that, that person is you know, isolated from others, um, and they can have you know, the sleep and the rest that, that they may need. But it's, the, the point of sharing this with you is to indicate that this is translated into modern day medicine and treatment, and, and it's become a very important uh, lifestyle. So, so the other thing is, this um, is uh, next, the next little bit I want to share with you is how we can change the circadian and how we can uh, and modify it um, with, with our own means. So um, there's a hormone in the brain, it's called melatonin, we've heard about this, some people swear by it for travel, um, it works for some people, it doesn't work for others. Um, its mechanism of action, how it works, is limited. Uh, we don't really understand how it works, although we know that the body does produce it. Uh, some people will take it prior to uh, flight and they try to sleep on the plane. Uh, some people feel very sick afterward, jet lagged. Uh, when I say jet lagged, but they feel very uh, tired. Um, but it, 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 it really does uh, have an effect on our sleep-wake cycle. One of the biggest uh, issues, and this, this is kind of fun, this was taken from NASA. This is an image of Winnipeg. This is Winnipeg at night. And you can see for our small city how bright it really is. 
And one of the biggest issues that we face is uh, modern day. So I don't know how many people, I mean, there's the, the night owls that we talked about earlier, but um, if you ever find yourself wanting to read your iPad or source or your computer at night, that is a problem because the blue frequency, the blue light frequency, disrupts the melatonin and disrupts our circadian and as a result it'll disrupt your sleep. So if you want to, if you don't believe me, if you have an iPad at home tonight, <laughs> sit there in front of it before you're ready to go to bed and just see if you're able to fall asleep afterward. You know, uh, read it for maybe a half hour, hour, if you have one of those, um, you know, books that you want to read. So, so the biggest thing with our young people now is the fact that they have these um, uh, games that they're playing at night or the iPhone. Uh, I know my wife likes to check her Facebook in case she missed something. So then she's up. But the fact is, is that um, the blue light is really a, a, a problem. But we can, we can change that. And so um, you know, we can modify circadian by trying to play with the frequency of the light. Um, we can also try and uh, look at the way uh, we can modify the way we, we see light. I, I, love this, I love this quote that's coming up. But the point is, is that light pollution and light really is, a, is an issue. So the blue light here from the readers and from the uh, phones is, is really something uh, to think about. This was taken many years ago, and I'm going to read it to you because the bottom you can't read uh, because of the, the size. This, is, this room is equipped with Edison electric light. Do not attempt to light with a match. <laughs> Simply turn the key on the door. And then the quote on the bottom says, the use of electricity for lighting is in no way harmful to health, nor does it affect soundness of sleep. So, um, okay. That's what was known when Edison invented the light bulb and uh, what people were thinking about. But as we know, uh, that to be a little different. So how can we address this? We can, we can play with, there are, there are many um, individuals who, who suffer seasonal affective disorders um, and they can treat that by exposing themselves to different frequencies of light at different times of the day. So this is a form of light therapy. Um, and, and this tends to work really, really well. And I, and I think that uh, with our dark days in the winter and, and uh, you know, evenings, uh, this works well. Alternatively, you know, people can wear um, UV blocking glasses, blue blocking light glasses, and, and these tend to work uh, well as well. So, you know, if, if you were to modulate the amount of blue light or frequency of blue light coming in, you know, and you want to have your candle or your reader, uh, your iPad or whatever, um, uh, you know, that's, that's fine, but take that into account. And then, of course, we can use light therapy to reset the circadian and reset um, our mood and uh, how we feel about things. Um, and again, the intensity and the light spectrum play, play a huge role. So these are, these are things that have often been taken for granted. And we live it, live it, and we do it, and we don't understand it. But you become hungry, you become tired, uh, become irritable. And um, you know some people function well. I mean, we have the largest hours of sunlight in, in, in the country. It can be cold, you know, be really, really cold in the wintertime, but at the same time, we do have sunlight. We have friends and colleagues who live in, in, in Vancouver, and, you know, they love it, and we love it in Vancouver as well. Uh, but as one example, um, when it's sunny, it's brilliant, but, you know, most of the time it's rainy and gloomy, and, and some people don't do well who may suffer from, uh, uh, you know, effective uh, mood issues. So it all depends what you want, um, but the point is, is that light plays a huge role in our daily functioning. I want to share with you one other study that I thought was really profound and maybe applicable to the group. So one of the things that we were interested in is if what if we make our own shift work mice? What would happen if we shifted the mice? And I showed you earlier a genetic defect that led to, you know, obesity. And so what we did was we took three groups of mice. We had sham mice, which were basically normal mice. They didn't do anything, sat around. And then we flipped the light-dark cycle in another group of mice. Actually, we shortened it. Um, so normally lights on at, you know, lights on at uh, 12 and lights off at 12, so 12 hours, seven hours, seven hour switch. And then what we do is we shorten the circadian. We, we took two hours in the morning and two hours at night. So instead of making these animals 10-10, we gave, uh, it's, or 12-12, we made them 10-10. So we, we tried to model a, a disrupted circadian rhythm that would often be seen with, with shift work. And this was for five days. This is what I want to share with you, five days. So shift work for five days. So on baseline, if you looked at cardiac function, again, the sham is here. 
and, and this is, the numbers aren't necessarily important, but I just want to show you. The 3.96, 3.96, 3.98, these are the same. There's no difference. This is left ventricular internal diameter. This is the size of the heart. So the bottom line is the parameter is not important. This is the functioning of the heart, ejection fraction, 77, 77, 76. That's exactly the same as far as I'm concerned. So there was no difference at baseline between these animals. But one of the things that we found was that if we simulated a heart attack in these, in these mice, if we gave them a heart attack right after the shift work, so the last day of the shift work, they're on off, on off for five days, the last day of the shift work we induced a heart attack. What I'm going to share with you is the following. This was really cool. The size of the infarct was bigger. There was increased heart weight. The, the, the stroke volume, or what, what the ventricle is producing as a form of cardiac function, is um, impaired and reduced contractility and reduced function. So cardiac output is just a measure of heart performance. I just want to share with you this diagram here. This is really cool. It's called a pressure volume loop. It's not rocket science. It's cardiovascular science, and it's very simple. So, so this, this figure here, this loop, represents the functioning of the heart. Everyone can see that. The red is the shift work, normal is the normal animals that had a heart attack, and then the sham, which had nothing done to them. Okay, so look what happens here. This is, an, this, this is, this is the normal. As soon as the person or the mouse had the heart attack, the, the curve shifted, the, the loop shifted rightward, and you could see that the, the shift work mice had even, in red, even worse. So as it's moving rightward and down, it implies that the function is impaired. Five days, that's all it took, five days. Okay, so one of the questions it was, could we somehow rectify this? Could we mitigate this? So one of the studies that are ongoing and one of, um, one of uh, the interests we had was to ask, how could we modify this? So um, there's literature that shows that exercise can have beneficial effects on aging. It can affect uh, the uh, beneficial effects of exercise on different body functions. And these different areas here, apoptosis and autophagy, are just biological processes that, that we study that influence the way the cell lives or dies. But the point was is that this was really interesting because aging effect um, and the exercise benefit uh, has, has been known for many years. And so we asked the question, if we exercise the mice, prior to the heart attack, could we make any difference? So we took the same mice. We took the sham mouse, the non-shift non work, and the shift work mouse. We shifted them for five days. But the, but the day before we induced heart attack, we let them exercise. We exercised them. So this is the protocol here, very straightforward. Day one, day two, day three, day four. Here it is, here's the, here's the, here's the, uh, the shift work. And right here, just before day five, just before the last shift, just before they were going to do their last shift, we exercised them. So we told them, go for a run and then go to work. That's basically what this was. What happened? So this is what happened. Remember the image I showed you before about the, uh, the shift work? Here, here is the uh, cardiac function. Normal is shown here in black. And here's the shift work without exercise. And here's the shift work with exercise in green. It absolutely mirrors the non-shift work animals. That means exercise, whatever exercise is doing, and we can talk about that, had a protective effect on shift work and its effect on, on cardiac outcome. And then the graphs at the bottom basically just show, um, you know, the, the cardiac parameters that we were looking at that we'd want to publish. Um, the ejection fraction is something really cool because this is the normal. You can see it goes down. The green line and the black lines, which is with exercise and without uh, shift work and, and, and heart attack uh, were almost identical and that's reflected here as well. So this work has been sent out for publication. Um, one of our stars, recent recruits, uh, Dr. Ina Rabinovich uh, Nikitin, we are fortunate to retain her and hire her as an assistant professor at the University of Manitoba and our Institute of Cardiovascular Sciences was working with me on this project and uh, the work is now uh, under consideration um, so hopefully that will get published shortly. So to summarize, what I really want to show is that, you know, these different biological processes affect the different, different organ systems in the body. And the circadian plays a critical role in our everyday lifestyle, in health and disease. Distru disturbing the circadian rhythms really increases our disease prevalence uh, and affects disease outcomes. And more, more importantly, what I did mention is that uh, the timing of different drugs and the kind of drugs that are taken morning, night, 
uh, have, a have a dramatic effect on our physiology, our, our well-being, and um, realigning the circadian, I think, is really something that's, that's quite important and thinking about in terms of disease moving forward. So my lab has sort of shifted toward this, this area. It's an area that I think is very understudied, although people have been studying it for many years at the genetic and cellular level, uh, very little is, is unknown. But when, when you put this in perspective, and you see the impact of changes in the circadian in terms of basic physiology, our, our sleep-wake cycle, how we feel, how we eat, um, the effect of obesity, the effect on um, you know, fat distribution within the body. And, and this, again, shows the different body clocks, how profound, how profound changing the light-dark cycle uh, will be. So where will this have an effect? We also do some collaborative work with the Canadian Space Agency. Some of the things that we've been engaged in is how will people live on the moon? How will people live on Mars? Deep, deep space travel. So not just restricted to um, you know, us in Winnipeg and a 24-hour light-dark cycle. This has larger implications for living in microgravity and, and other places. And yes, we're doing that kind of work here in Winnipeg, which is, which is quite exciting. So with that, I'm going to close. I, I hope that I enlightened you and shared with you some of the, what I think is, is interesting work. Our work, as Tracy had mentioned, is you know, funded by the Canadian uh, Institutes for Health Research, Heart and Stroke Foundation. This is my fabulous crew that uh, I get to work with every day. This is a picture of Ina, uh, who, as I mentioned, just uh, we were able to recruit as an assistant professor. Um, our collaborators, uh, Dr. God Asher at the Weizmann Institute in Israel, Junichi Sodashima, in uh, Newark, New Jersey, and one of our other collaborators not listed is uh, Dr. Tammy Martino at the University of Guelph. So we have very large reaching uh, networks, uh, both in US and Canada and, uh, and in Europe. So with that, I will say thank you for your time. <laughs> with that, I'll stop and be happy to take questions. Hi. Um, my husband has had heart disease since about age 45, had to have a bypass, blah, blah. Very concerning. I want him to live a really long life, much longer than me, actually. And I have polycystic ovarian syndrome, which has affected like my body type and all sorts of other things, including getting type two diabetes around that time. So I, one of the, and we also have anxiety in both um, sides of the family. So one of the things that I found really interesting is that um, they say adrenaline is highest in the morning, which affects anxiety. And I'm kind of wondering, is that related because we have higher testosterone in the morning? Or is it something different? And what would you recommend so that we stay healthy and aren't having heart attacks or anxiety attacks in the morning? Thank you. Um, so so uh, thank you for the question. Very, very interesting. Um, adrenaline or norepinephrine or epinephrine are, are stress hormones. And they typically are released like cortisol early morning. Typically, um, the way the circadian was originally thought of, the circadian biology in general was thought of um, as, as a mechanism to prepare the body for different things. So, for example, if you're going to go for a run, um, your heart rate would start increasing. Even before you even started going for the run, you start putting on your joggers and your, you know, you get that sense, I'm going for a run. The body is prepared. The same thing with the circadian. The body is being prepared to wake up. So hormones like norepinephrine or adrenaline, uh, cortisol uh, is, are, are, are produced. There's other um, hormones that are produced by the body. Um, it, it isn't necessarily a bad thing. I mean, this is, par this is part and parcel with the increase in blood pressure in the morning. And, and we attribute the increased heart attack and increased stroke to the increased blood pressure in susceptible individuals. So um, I can't advise you on, on you know, uh, taking drugs or not, beta blockers or otherwise, to, to, to subdue that. But that's part of the biological process. And that's something that, that you know, we're learning to understand why that works. A discussion with your physician, if you know that your you know, blood pressure is up in the morning and you're susceptible to increased blood pressure effects, then that might be something to, to think about. But the, the, you, you raise a very interesting question that, that's related to the whole circadian and the whole cycle of you know, sleep-wake cycles. Hi, thank you so much. That was very interesting. I wondered if there's any research done on the profoundly blind. I have a sister who became 
profoundly blind eight years ago. And this gives me a whole new empathy to what she might be going through and what's happening to her body. Right, thank you. Um, so blind people, they experience something called 24-7. Um, there are drugs available to help them uh, resynchronize the, uh, the circadian, but um, blind people in particular, they don't get the same, they don't get the same light cues as, as we would. They get other cues that, that do reset the circadian. So um, noise, food, uh, I mentioned drug, exercise can, can, can reestablish the circadian. So even if, um, you're, in your case, your sister can't process light the way we would process it, there's other ways around, um, you know, uh, resetting or helping her circadian. Um, but, but yes, that's an issue. There are drugs on the market that do address that. Uh, that you know, she could ask her physician uh, uh, about it, but um, the condition I know is called 24-7. Blind people do have a circadian, but it's, it's much shifted uh, compared to what, to what we have. So I don't know if that answers your question or not, but um, you know, it, is, it, is, it is something to, uh, to think about. Um, if we did go to one uh, system, one and and we didn't, we stopped the changing back and forth in the spring. Uh, the day, daylight savings. Yeah, is yes. that that's yes. the one you prefer? Oh, or is that or no? <laughs> I want the most light possible. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That was my that was my yeah. question. Yeah. What what what, what would I system do you think would be best? I think having most light. Okay. Which most would, light possible. So so we would lose the uh, we would we would lose the hour of of sleep, but gain the hour of uh, of sunlight. Right? Which would be daylight savings. Daylight savings. Yeah, daylight yeah. savings. Yeah. yeah. No, thank and you. I, and I think that's where people are, are, are going in that direction. I think so too. Yeah. 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 Thanks. Thank you. Hello. I recently came back from Europe and I had no problems going there regarding jet lag, but coming back it took me four or five days to feel normal again. Is that because of the the circadian rhythm being accelerated as you're going east rather than when you're coming back? Yeah, thank you. I've got the same problem. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, easier, it's easier to go east than it is to go west. When you, when you travel with the sun, if you can sleep on the plane and you get to where you're supposed to get, you notice most flights to Europe are always late afternoon and the plan is for you to arrive mid-afternoon or early morning or mid-afternoon. The plan is to try and sleep if you can on the plane. A lot of people can't. Um, but the point is, is you'd start your day and, and it's very easy to start your day with the light. When you return from, from Europe to Canada, it's usually a morning flight in Europe and it brings you back mid-afternoon or later in the evening. And the idea is to jump into bed and go to sleep, but a lot of people can't because of, you know, they're anxious and they're just back. Um, but, but that's what it is. It's harder to, it's harder to return to your, um, it's easier to reset the clock with light um, and often if you travel, uh, it, it's often suggested to, you know, sit in the sun for a bit. And you'll find if you go uh, Europe and seven hour behind, you sit in the sun or you find the sun, your, your, your clock will, will readjust much quicker. Coming back, it's much more difficult. And, and you're quite right. It's because the, the circadian had been shifted uh, seven hours. You're forcing your body all of a sudden and you're losing the sleep. You're losing probably seven hours of sleep if you didn't sleep on the plane. You show up our time in Europe, three in the morning, it's eight o'clock in the morning in, uh, in Europe, and, and you know, basically have the whole day. So what I try to do, which is terrible, is to stay up until 10 o'clock at night. And, 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 I've, and I've been, I was suffering, like, you know, oh, come on. Just a, and then the worst, the worst, the worst is closing your eyes for five minutes, right? You close your eyes for five minutes, and you realize later it's an hour. And if you ever take an afternoon nap and you fall asleep, you, say only, you, you feel really good if it's a short time. But you wake up and you feel horrible. You wish you never had that little nap because your body is still, still asleep. So I, ho I hope that kind of helped you. Thank you. Hi. Hi, I'm just curious about people who live in the far north where their, their light dark is very, very unbalanced for several sure. years. Sure, 
Sure. So, so the question for those uh, on Zoom came, uh, what happens to the folks uh, who live in the far north where their um, light, light cycle is uh, completely disrupted? Yeah, so um, that's a very good question. Uh, those individuals have issues with respect to uh, mood disorders and increased uh, incidence of cardiovascular disease um, because there are some parts up north where it's dark, you know, most of the time, uh, you know, I think there's only one or two two days of sunlight, and then basically it's it's dark for the whole time. So yeah, that's a consideration as well. Um, many circadian studies have been done on the poles uh, for the, for that reason. Antarctica, we have light all the time, or dark uh, up up in the Arctic. But it's it's something to uh, and even even animals. So no one asked me yet. Maybe you'll ask me because of the time about animals. One of the curiosities I had getting into this field was hibernating animals. So you figured there's a hibernating animal. What does it do in the, in the you know, it, it eats and then it, it collects food and then basically goes to sleep and then you don't, you don't see it for the next, you know, six months until after winter. So their, their metabolism and their circadian is completely shut down. They're, they're, they have a completely different metabolism. They have different heart rate, different, different you know, blood pressure, et cetera. And uh, they're programmed. And uh, it's, it's an interesting biology that not all animals hibernate. Uh, some do, um, but it's it's interesting to try and understand how that hibernating animal, that mechanism, can be translated into uh, into humans, and and the prevalence of, of, of disease. I'd like to speak for winter too. Oh, okay. <laughs> You know, it's interesting because what we call Zeitgebers, Zeitgeber is a timekeeper. It was adopted from the German word timekeeper. And anything that will, will, will change the circadian is a Zeitgeber. Food, light, cold, uh, stress. These have very profound effects on, on, on setting the clock. The one thing I want to, the take home message is, people may say they want to lose weight. Yes? So they say, well, I'm going to have dinner and I'm not going to eat after 8 o'clock. Right? Why? Because the body is programmed. You normally, historically, you'd have dinner, you'd go to sleep at 8 o'clock, you'd have 12 hours of sleep, the 12 hours, and you'd wake up in the morning. So your body is metabolizing whatever you ate and all the reparative processes are going on. Now, that was 8 o'clock. You start eating at 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, either because you're watching some late night show or you're a shift worker. A shift worker is now eating later at night. That, that clock that was set to metabolize all those things that we're eating during the day at 8 o'clock onward now gets shifted. All right, so if you're eating food, the food now resets the circadian. And so now instead of somebody metabolizing food starting from 8 to midnight, maybe they're working from 11 onward. And that's where the weight gain comes from. So if you take a look at a lot of shift workers, they're susceptible to metabolic syndrome, weight gain, um, and other forms of cardiovascular disease. And that's why we thought the exercise was quite profound because if this does pan out, send someone for an exercise bout just before their uh, you know, shift and perhaps that'll reduce their incidence of, uh, of heart disease. So anyway, that's, that's the take home, take home message. Any last questions? No, and there's nothing up there. Just okay. making sure that the slides will be available if somebody was asking. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I uh, was, was honored to be here this morning. Thank you for taking your time. I hope I didn't put you to sleep. And uh, I hope uh, Tracy will invite me back again at some point and <laughs> maybe share more with you. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much, everybody. As I mentioned, there's coffee and cookies outside waiting for you. Um, thank you to everybody joining us virtually. We really appreciate it. And as uh, you may have seen some of the one of the questions up at the front, so this is being recorded, and we do that so we can put it on our website. Is not everybody can view it at the same time. Uh, so uh, that's where you'll be able to see the slides again. So I encourage you to look at this and, and other lectures that we have hosted. So our next one, we're not back together until November the 10th. And the reason for that is we're going on the road uh, to do a number of different alumni and donor events. And in next week, we're in Vancouver. So talking about time changes, Vancouver, Calgary, then the next week, Toronto and Ottawa, then an event in Brandon. And so anyways, that's why we're, we're not back until November the 10th. But on that day, we will have Dr. Rusty Solimanov.
He is an assistant professor in the Faculty of Social Work, and he will be speaking on Improving the Health Outcomes of Marginalized Peoples in Manitoba, Findings from Infectious Disease and Addictions Research. So you'll want to make sure that you're here for that. So again, thank you very much. Have a wonderful day, and we will see you in a few weeks. (laughs) 